to click one of these things and um, when I say come and worship then you will do one of the things that you have chosen to do so you have your choices uh, one of your expressions of praise might be to bow your head in prayer just like normal or you might want to fold your hands in prayer that way or you may raise your hands in prayer that's okay yeah it is the roof will not fall down so that's going to be your response uh, to come and worship. You all have one of those things that you're going to do? Because you don't have to do them all. You just have to do one. Okay? So bow your head, hold your hands, or raise your hands. Okay? Let us begin. Whatever is holding you back, whatever is keeping you down, whatever is making you weak, leave it all behind you. Love has found you now. Come and worship. Bring your hopes and your dreams. Bring your fears and your doubts. Now is the time to let it all out. Come and worship. You guys got this. Here you will find healing and peace and love beyond anything you can imagine. Come and worship. Let us pray. Lord, may your name be praised today wherever we are. We are gathered from around this area, indeed from all parts of the world. You alone give us life and air. You give us all that we see. From you, we receive and give love. From you, we are set in families, created both by blood and by choice. And from you, we receive mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. We do need that forgiveness, Heavenly Father. We do not live as you want us to live. You call us to speak up and we, we are silent. You challenge us to be a light and we hide your light. You call us to love all people as you love us and we judge. We condemn and we ignore. In times of grief and hopelessness, we turn to anything but you who are our source of life and truth and love. So Lord, when our circumstances squeeze out joy and hope, remind us that you indeed are the God of new creation. And when we forget that all things end, remind us that your love continues. Forgive us, love us, and resurrection. And by the power of and the love of your son, Jesus Christ, we ask that you hear our silent prayers of confession. Friends, hear the good news. God is merciful and full of steadfast love. God will not forget us. God will wash us clean and lead us on paths of steadfast love and faithfulness. He hears our cries and forgives us. Friends, believe this and live as forgiven people. We are forgiven in the name of Jesus. And all God's children said, amen. This morning, our scripture is going to, our Old Testament uh, psalm is coming uh, from 103, and I'm reading from a version that is the um, Common English Bible, so it'll be a little different than uh, maybe what you have with you or in your pew. And I'll be reading verses 1 through 5 and 14 through 17 in Psalm 103. Let my whole being bless the Lord. 
Let everything inside me bless his holy name. Let my whole being bless the Lord and never forget all his good deeds, how God forgives all your sins, heals all your sicknesses, saves your life from the pit, crowns you with faithful love and compassion, and satisfies you with plenty of good things so that your youth is made fresh like an eagle's. Because God knows how we are made. God remembers we are dust. The days of human life are like grass. They bloom like a wildflower, but when the wind blows through it, it's gone. Even the ground where it stood doesn't remember it. But the Lord's faithful love is for forever ago to forever from now for those who honor him. Such a good word for us this morning. As we think of God's love, uh, we remember in Matthew 22, chapter 22, Jesus was asked by the Pharisees. He, he was asked, teacher, what's the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. But to his disciples... Jesus has a different answer, not a whole lot different, but slightly different. Because in, the, in John 13, verse 35, Jesus says this to his disciples. I give you a new commandment. Love one another, love each other, just as I have loved you. So you also must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples, when you love each other. Do we have the opportunity to show love to each other so that others will know that we are Christ's disciples? So today in our time of offering, I want to challenge you to ask God for bold new ways that this congregation can show love here to each other, to, you, to your family, to your neighbors, and to our community. What bold way might we take the resources and the love and the gifts that we have been given and send them out in a mighty way. And then this will show that agape love that we have been reading about in and throughout chapter 13. So I invite you to prepare your financial gifts, your heart and your mind as we uh, listen to Marianne. <laughs> Thank you. I think that might have been in a celebration of Pat's life. Let's pray. Holy God, we do thank you for giving us what we need. We are grateful. But hear our bold prayer for new ways that this congregation can go out and love, not just each other and our families, but this community. Then take these offerings of our hearts and our hands and our finances and by your power and love, multiply them and send them out into the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I found something that I thought I would share with you this morning. And it's 1 Corinthians 13, and it's called the Christmas version. And it goes like this. If I decorate my house perfectly with plaid bows, strands of twinkling lights and shiny balls, but do not have love, I'm just another decorator. If I slave away in the kitchen baking dozens of Christmas cookies, preparing gourmet meals and arranging a beautifully adorned table at mealtimes, 
but do not have love, I'm just another cook. If I work at a soup kitchen and carol in the nursing home and give all that I have to charity, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. If I trim the spruce with shimmering angels and crocheted snowflakes, attend a myriad of holiday parties and sing in the choir's cantata, but do not focus on Christ, I have missed the point. Love stops the cooking to hug the child. Love sets aside the decorating to kiss the spouse. Love is kind, though harried and tired. Love does not envy another's home that has coordinated Christmas china and table linens. Love does not yell at the kids to get out of the way, but is thankful they are there to be in the way. Love does not give only to those who are able to give in return, but rejoices in giving to those who cannot. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. Toys will break, pearl necklaces will be lost, golf clubs will rust, but giving the gift of love will endure. Yes, things will break, they'll get lost, they will rust or become obsolete. Just think about this. Uh, one of the books that I'm reading, making my way slowly through, is a book um, called Centennial that was written by a man whose name just Michener. And in it, he begins at the very beginning of the history of the, the location in Colorado. And he, he talks about all of the things that have lived there, all the transitions that it made. And he talks about the woolly mammoths, they're gone. He talks about the dinosaurs, they're gone. You think about it with uh, things that are gone today, phone booth, rotary phone, floppy disks, fax machines, typewriters, Atari, encyclopedias, card catalog at the library, uh, eight track, VHS, they're gone. They're obsolete. And these are mostly just in the last 20 years. Obsolete means it's no longer needed because it's been replaced by something better. And that is Paul's point in verses 8 through 12. Listen to his words from chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians, verses 8 through 12. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in these very short, compact verses, Paul makes two points. And he points out that love is everlasting and everything else is temporary. And then at the same time, he does this comparison thing between the now that we know and the yet then that is yet to come. So Paul uses these several examples that, uh, that help to explain what he means. And he goes back to the very first three spiritual gifts that he referred to in what we call the verses one through three. You, you do remember that Paul did not label his verses and chapters, but he goes back a bit to talk about the gifts that people had in the Corinthian congregation. And they were uh, very proud of them, those who had the gifts of prophesying and some of the other ones. And they believed that their gifts made them higher status than other people. And they probably received that from other members of the congregation. But Paul realized that they were not using their gifts, their God-given, Holy Spirit-driven gifts to build themselves up. They were, that's what they were doing. And they were doing it without love. They were doing it for themselves. Now, the spiritual gifts of prophecy and tongues and knowledge were present in the Corinthian congregation. Prophecy being the spiritual gift or the Holy Spirit gift of receiving divinely inspired messages and then delivering it to others in the congregation. Tongues means a person speaking divinely inspired known or unknown language. And then knowledge is that divinely inspired ability to teach others about God. Each of us has a 
a beneficial, each of them has a beneficial, really important role in, in that congregation. In 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul wrote in 7, says, now to each one, each one of the people, one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. See, each spiritual gift is important to the congregation, as important as a hand or a foot or an eye is to our own bodies. In verse 8, Paul states, love never ends, but then one day prophecy will come to an end. Then one day tongues will cease. Then one day knowledge will pass away. Prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, Paul says, are for now, for today. They are spiritual gifts to be used to build up the congregation. Now, he could have chosen other spiritual gifts, and so had he looked at another congregation, had he been writing to another congregation, he may have had other spiritual gifts that he was, was seeing that were being used without love. But those three were the ones in the, in the Corinthian congregation. So these spiritual gifts are to be used to build up the congregation for now. But one day they're going to be unnecessary. They'll be obsolete. They'll be replaced by something better. In verse 9, Paul says, now our knowledge of God is limited. It's partial. It too is incomplete. We don't know the whole picture. And then in, and this is in verse 10, Paul says, one day we will know the full completeness or the perfection is another word of God. And then the imperfect or the substitute will become useless and obsolete and it will pass away. But for now, today, we don't know everything. We can't know everything. And we'll never know everything until Jesus comes again or we see him face to face. As John Calvin said, perfection begins at death. I find this is great news. This is hugely good news because doubts and questions that sometimes we think are bad and wrong are not. They come because our knowledge is limited. We can't fill in those gaps of mystery or make sense to conflicting verses in scripture or even understand the deep depths of Jesus' parables. We just can't. So what can we do? Well, we can wrestle with the questions, we can doubt, we can pray, we can discuss, we can debate, but we do this with a deep understanding that we don't know it all and no one does. It is beyond our human capacity. <laughs> and I love this because if someone thinks they do, well, Paul had a word to say about this. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, verse 2, he says, anyone who claims to know all of the answers doesn't really know very much. I find that very humbling. And I think it should humble us and yet be comforting because when we have doubts, when we, we have questions, we can understand it. it's because we can't see the whole picture. The interpreter's Bible says this, our faith will never be full until we see God face to face. It, but if we are faithful to what we can believe, if we can grab onto what we can believe, then we are on the road to more perfect knowledge and it will surely come. And then verse 11, Paul uses another example, and he pulls this time from his own experience. Well, actually, it's one we can all relate to, uh, because he wrote, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish things. Now, as adults, we rarely throw temper tantrums. We've learned to use our words, and we've learned patience. We don't go skateboarding anymore or try to do somersaults on the floor because if we did it, we'd feel it the next day and that would probably be the end of those childish ways. When we, like Paul, become adults, we become mature and we give up those, those childish ways even that as it relates to our faith. Those become obsolete and we grow up in faith and we trust in God. In verse 12, then he goes on to say, and this is another example. Now we can see the face of God is like a, now all we can see of God is like a cloudy picture in a mirror. But then later we will see him face to face. And so now what we're, it's like looking at a, if you imagine a mirror in front of you, like here, and, um, and you're looking at somebody way in the back, they're fuzzy and they're blurry and, and they, they, 
they're dim, it's just not clear. In Ken Bailey's book on Paul through the Mediterranean eyes, he explains that ancient mirrors you see were made of polished brass. And sometimes even those polished brass surfaces would have like a, 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 like a superhero or one of their pagan gods etched on it. So when someone would look at themselves in this polished brass, they would see also the reflection of that uh, god, that pagan god. And so they could kind of imagine that they were uh, that pagan god, but it eventually would tarnish. It eventually would grow dark and blurry and become useless and dim but it won't always be that way. When Christ comes again, then we will see him face to face. When Christ comes, then all that we thought was important will disappear. When Christ comes, then this imperfect world that we live in will be obsolete and it will be replaced by God's perfect world because the work Jesus was sent here to do on earth will come to an end, a completion, a perfect end. And if you take a look at uh, chapter 21 in Revelations, it gives us this glimpse, uh, this vision that John had into what God's perfect world will be like when God, it says, uh, he comes to live here on earth. This holy city will come down out of heaven and be here on earth. And, and this is what it says, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain or depression or cancer or heartbreak or heart attacks or viruses or anything depression, all of that will be gone for the old order will indeed pass away, but not love because why? Because love never ends. The interesting thing about this is that the literal translation will say love will never fail or fall. And some of your Bibles may say that. And you may remember a few years ago when that section of uh, Highway 5 uh, fell, failed, the road failed and it fell down the side of the, um, of, of into, I don't know what it went into, some gully or something. And that's the kind of thing that Paul is talking about. Because back in Paul's days, roads were narrow and the paths were on steep uh, hills. And so sometimes even the road itself, like out there, would fall down or a person could literally fall off the road. Those were real possibilities, but he's thinking, see, love never does that. Love never falls, it never fails. And Bailey again notes that Christ's love never fell down, even while he was nailed to the cross. That's love. Love is permanent. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Whenever we hold on to whatever we hold on to as security right now, today, will pass away, but not love. Love will continue on and on and on. And I love how N.T. Wright said this. He, he calls love the ultimate bridge. And it's a bridge from the present Christian living into the future kingdom. See, as Christians, we are called, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14, we're called to do everything with love to show God's love to our neighbors and to live out what God, love is rather than what love is not. So yesterday I was practicing loving and I found I needed the phrase love is patient. So I had gone into Lowe's. I had one item to return. I walked in, I'm like, great. There's just one person in, at the counter already. This is gonna be easy. This is gonna be quick. I was getting hungry. If you know me, that's never a good time. Anyway, both of the customer service people had one person with them and there was me and I think there might've been somebody else there. Well, their returns kept getting longer and longer and longer and longer. And then the customer service guy that I was in line with for, he left with the customer and I'm like, where are they going? And finally, they came back, but as I was there and I could feel myself getting impatient, I just started to say, love is patient. And I was saying it to myself, okay? Uh, love is patient. Love is patient. Love is patient. Love is patient. And so when I stepped up to talk to that customer service person, I found that my impatience had gone. And that's the Holy Spirit at work. And Paul ends verse 12 in this way. 
but then I will know completely in the same way that I have been completely known by God. God knows you. God loved you well before you were even a twinkle in your mother's eye. And even then, God loves you. And God showed his love in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is the love that we celebrate at Christmas and all year long. It is a love that will never become obsolete or fade away because God's love never ends. And for that, I say, thanks be to God. God be the glory. Amen. Next week, we will um, yeah. we'll take a look at the last verse in chapter 13. And uh, we will also end our series of... Um, of First Corinthians on love. Love is going to continue, but our, our series will not. I also wanted to uh, make sure that everyone was aware that um, uh, Frank Bogardus did go to be with the Lord last night. His, he was an easy passing, and um, there will be a funeral, uh, sorry, a memorial service with military honors, um, but that has not been planned yet, but a word will go out about that. And if you could let people know, I know that a number of people knew him here in town. And so please be sure to pass that word out for, for us. Thank you. Will you please uh, pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are awesome and amazing. And we are grateful beyond words for all of your gifts. Thank you for the days that you do give to us. We have so much. We have so many things, so many financial gifts and such beautiful surroundings. We are blessed, and sometimes we forget that. We think things are permanent, but they are not. Everything fades away. Eventually, everything will rust and fail and become obsolete, but not your love, because your love continues forever and ever. We don't have to wonder if you still love us in the morning. We don't have to wonder how to be your disciple. We just love other people. Help us to do that. Today, Lord, we ask you to hear our prayers for the nations and for our leaders, for the people in Texas and Louisiana who have been impacted by the hurricane. We continue to pray for Pat and for Frank Bogardus' family and friends. We ask, Lord, for you to comfort those who are grieving, encourage those who are living in deep darkness, courage to the voiceless, and power to the weak. We pray for those who need your healing power in their lives, both physically and mentally, and, and we especially lift up to you today Deputy Brad Hump um, Hampton. We ask you, Lord, for safety for our troops and for those who serve the public, our policemen, our firemen, our hospital staff. We pray for a hedge of protection to be around our loved ones, and we especially lift up Heron and Joy as he is in the hospital uh, and not doing well, suffering from COVID. We pray for comfort and peace for their neighbors, Pam and Mike. Lord, we ask that you give us the power to be your love and light in our communities, in our families, wherever you place us. In your mercy, let us love one another for you are love. Strengthen the weak, give courage to the fearful energy to serve you and joy to live as your disciples of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now I invite you to receive the blessing. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>